Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hiya, it's Jackie. That's my new, my new one. Hiya. Hiya. Okay. Sound like, this is like Miss Piggy. Hiya. Well, maybe I am Miss Piggy. Okay. You're a puppet? Jackie Miss Piggy McDonald. (laughs) Okay. And it's me, Diana, but I bring a lot more Fozzie Bear energy to this podcast. Yes, that's true. Waka waka, everybody. Well, guys, I don't know about you, but after doing 200 podcast episodes, plus a bunch of bonuses and previews and stuff, I think it's time for this podcast about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research in which every week we discuss a topic related to behavior analysis. To be in my rearview mirror, I'm going to go find a new job. I found a place, actually, I was interviewing there the other day, and and they said that my caseload would be uh, hundreds big. They might ask me to do OT, speech. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. What do you, what do you think? Were Is you this, into uh, it? I mean, like, they were like, paying really good. Yeah. So I was thinking it's but probably... How many hours was it? Over? I mean, they said just make up whatever hours I want to. It was fine. Don't worry about it. It all works that out. That sounds like a great decision. I think it sounds like an amazing decision Wait, myself. You don't need any supervision though, right? Do there's, I need supervision? There's no supervision in this job because they you said, don't need it. They said if I think I know what I'm doing, it's probably good enough. All right. Yeah, right? Winning. Okay, Sounds so I, I think it's start? probably a good job. I mean, should we double check the ethics code or anything? Or no. Hang on. I think someone's calling in. What? The podcast. Oh, no. Bring, bring, it's, bring. it's the spirit of ethical decision making himself. We're joined by a special guest. Dr. Matthew Broadhead, or as we like to call him, Sir Matthew. Matthew, (laughs) hooray, you're here on the show to help us with our ethical conundrums. Thank you so much for having me. I, you know, as as Sir Matthew Broadhead, I look forward to hopefully living up to my name and fulfilling <laughs> fulfilling the the honorable role bestowed upon me. And hopefully listeners, you know, agree with that. Oh, good. Well, all joking aside, you know, hopefully when I wake up in the morning, you know, it'll be Christmas Day and I'll learn my ethical lesson. Uh, I'm sure that will all be happening. But before we continue with the bit, be okay. <laughs> Matthew, please, I'm sure everybody out there has seen your name in, in, in your research and some, in so many of your publications, but please tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I am, see, I grew up in northern Michigan in a small town called Harbor Springs and a pretty rural part of northern Michigan. And I went to undergrad at Western Michigan University. It was just one of the two places that I had been looking at in terms of a college education. And I just sort of stumbled into behavior analysis there. Turns out that Western just fortunately for me had a really incredible and still does, you know, behavior analysis psychology program. And so got my bachelor's there and stuck around for a master's degree. And was really fortunate to learn uh, all sorts of really fun stuff about organizational behavior management, behavioral systems, and so which is stuff that's really stuck with me too. And so from there, I decided that I needed to spend some time away from the Midwest, as you do, and went out to Utah State University and got my PhD out there with, mm. with Tom Higby. So, you know, between then and now, I worked briefly at Utah, uh, excuse me, at Purdue University for a couple of years, but I've been at Michigan State University since 2016, where I'm now an associate professor and I'm in the College of Education here. And we have a hybrid master's in ABA program and um, also a doctoral program too. And I study social skill development, ethical and professional decision making, and just love my job, love to talk about behavior analysis and and decision-making, social skills, and of course, ethics. So it's great to be here. So Matt, before we start, you know, we're going to be talking all about ethical decision-making, you know, whether I'm making the right call, giving up this podcasting lifestyle for this new, lucrative, potentially life. non-ethical business adventure. But I do have a bone to pick with you, Matt. I did read a couple years back, I know you had a, a publication or you were an editor on uh, Practical Ethics for effective treatment of autism spectrum disorder. Matt, I like my ethics to have a right and a wrong answer. (laughs) I found your book really made everything so complicated. You didn't make it complicated, but you really pointed out just how many variables there are in ethical decision-making. I did not like that. I just want there to be the one right answer. So if you do a second edition, if you could please just kind of just here was the right answer all along, you know, it was this one. 
you, you, you know what? It's funny. You're just a little late. I just sent press accept on the proofs that went to the publisher for the second edition. So oh, no. had you had me on oh. sooner, maybe we could have dealt with that. But you're just going to have to wait until the next opportunity to revise uh, the book. So, oh. Well, maybe luck. in the second edition, everything's much more concrete. It may be ethics changed since maybe the last ethics edition. Ethics changed, right? I mean, All right, I'm going to ask Matt to send me a personalized copy where you just cross out like the paragraphs <laughs> upon paragraphs of like really well thought out oh, discussions yeah. <laughs> and just be like, it was unethical. And just underline it. Just that'd be great. Really it's, it's straight it. up just like redacted, like yep. like, yeah. like like CIA, <laughs> like top clearance, like confidentiality stuff. It's just like black lines, the whole book. That's yes. you'll get it. You'll get it in the mail and, you know, it will be. You know, right up there, like, you know, from Sir Matthew Broadhead. And you, know, <laughs> you know what? That would be an amazing present. I hope, <laughs> I really now hope it comes. Well, you love to live in black and white. I know. But I love to live in the gray. That's my favorite area. I knew you were going to say that. I actually thought that as I was driving mm -hmm. in yep. my car today that you were going to say that phrase at some point tonight. I say it a lot. I say it to my <laughs> students, too. I'm like, well, it depends. Mm hmm. Right. And that's why I love living in the Midwest, because that's what the weather's like all the time. Yeah, nice. there, there you go. go. So despite the fact that you're doing, you know, great research and great work on ethics, man, you have some you know, great takes on, on the code and collaboration. I do appreciate that you have also done a lot of focus on decision making and decision trees. So for folks like me that want there to be a yes or a no, I, there's a glimmer of hope mm -hmm. that sometimes I will I will get I will get a little bit more of, of what I'm looking for in my decision making just a little bit at least you know that decision making tree we totally fangirled it if you ever listen to that episode mm -hmm. we like hearted Hard. it yeah. all over it. it was hearts all over the page phew it was like that was like a love fest yeah but mm -hmm. you know what I like about a decision tree is that it operationally breaks down the gray yes right it it breaks through and shows you all of the reasons why something may fall into this category, that category, depending on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. and Matt, I'm assuming you didn't get into ethical decision making and ethics because you knew it would annoy me if you like wrote really complex things. It probably was a different background. So how, how did you come to, you know, be interested in studying and writing about ethics and, and decision making itself? Sure. Well, I've really, really enjoyed philosophy. I just think like casually through my life and when, when I was a master's student at Western, you know, I had really positive interactions with Wayne Fuqua and, and, and Rick Spates, both, you know, who are pretty formative in, you know, in the area of ethics. And I also, you know, in thinking about this question, too, I remember going to a conference as maybe a first year graduate student and watching John Bailey give a presentation there. And I thought, wow, this is really this is really fascinating stuff. I'm really, really interested in this. And of course, we read his book. And it was when I started my PhD program that my advisor, Tom Higby, had, you know, encouraged me to develop these ideas further. And I remember the first time ever presented on this topic was at Calaba early 2011. So it was really my first professional conference or, or foray into talking about ethics. And that was a systems presentation. And, you know, I think that that's been kind of key to everything that I've done is, is taking that systems perspective. And, and I think that that, you know, fits into the flow chart, decision making algorithm stuff quite well. And, you know, I think it's just a good way to be able to see the world. I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of talk about how OBM and behavioral systems really aren't taught enough and need to be taught, you know, more. And, and I, I can't, ex you know, emphasize that enough of the value add that they bring. And I think the practicality they can add to to talking about something that, I mean, is complex, but, you know, I like to try to break it down so people can understand it because if, or, or can make better use of it, because if it just remains complex or difficult, then we, you know, we're not going to be able to put these really important things to practice. So tonight we'll be discussing two of Matt's articles. So it's written with some collaborators. Diana, would you like to tell us what we'll be, I mean, Matt already knows, but, you know, tell the audience what we'll be discussing. <laughs> Sure. For the benefit of the audience, I will do so. So we're going to review two articles for today. The first is titled, How to Identify Ethical Practices in Organizations Prior to Employment. And that's by Broadhead, Quigley, and Cox, published in Behavior Analysis and Practice 2018. And the second is titled, A Proof of Concept Analysis of Decision-Making with Time Series Data. That's by Cox and Broadhead in the Psychological Record 
2021. Excellent. Yeah. It's so hot off the press. Just hot off the presses. So, Matt, as behavior analysts, we make tons of decisions every single day. If you had to sort of rank some of those, like, what do you see as sort of the top decisions, you know, a behavior analyst probably needs to make in a day? And kind of where does ethics fall in there? So, I guess to, to answer the second part of that first, I think I think ethics falls into, you know, every decision that we're making in our capacity as a behavior analyst or you know having a BCBA credential if we want to you know get technical about that I guess and and so you know if we're doing things as a behavior analyst you know hopefully they're aligning with the BACB code and you know even something as simple as taking data getting along well with others and just selecting the the best treatments for our clients all of those things you know are, are pretty well described as things that we need to be doing you know in accordance with the ethics code but when I when I think about you know issues or barriers, I guess to making decisions, you know one of the things that I continue to think about is how to access evidence and how to make you know good use or sense of that evidence. You know because I I you know I'm lucky because I work at the university and I have access to this major database of research, but I know that the research is not as readily available to users. And, and I think that that's a science communication problem, you know, to some degree. But I also think that people see this information that's published and, and have trouble contextualizing it to the problem that they're facing where they need to understand the similarities and differences between the research study and the problems that they're facing and as well acknowledge their own knowledge, skills, and abilities and the, the individual cultural and contextual variables at play, relevant to the client or, or anyone else in the community, and engage in that really complex, complex process and make sense of it in a way in, in which it sort of renders effective treatment. You know, colloquially refer to that as you know, the process of evidence-based practice and decision making. And so but you know, I think it's accessing and making making sense of the evidence is perhaps one of the most common barriers that I you know see as I wander through you know the British countryside as Sir Matthew Broadhead, right? That's, <laughs> which is fun a fun thing to do. I you know I I, I have nothing against horses or, or walks uh, or strolls along the countryside. It's very enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jodhpurs maybe Heath. I'm thinking of <laughs> as well. So is it that sort of accessing or, or understanding the evidence space that really gets in the way. You know, I, I, I sort of think when one is making decisions, if we had all the information, we'd always make the best decisions, but we don't always have the best information. I mean, is it just that, you know, lack of knowledge that you see as a big barrier to making great decisions or ethical decisions? Or, I mean, are, are there other factors that tend to maybe even mask the, the idea that you even have the best information? I mean, what do you think in terms of those barriers? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think one of it, one of them, you know, that I've been thinking about recently is is, is understanding the limitations of of the body of work, and you know that something is published in a journal alone doesn't make it the end all be all. And I can you know point to Andrew Wakefield's study on you know vaccines causing yes. autism <laughs> as 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 a prime example of that. And so, and I'm not saying that you know, that's the case with the papers that are published in Java. I mean, that's you know, obviously a very reputable journal, but, you know, to understand that everything has limitations, every everything has, you know, contextual constraints. And so it's just being intellectually honest with ourselves about that, taking that into account with the bigger picture in our own knowledge, skills, and abilities, and in the specific needs of the client, I think it, then it just becomes a, a, you know, a tall ask, but, but that's what I think being a behavior analyst is you know, that's the work that we kind of have to do to be, or that we need to do to be successful. Um, It's not easy, but I think that's what needs to to be done to do the job well. One thing I was thinking about when I read your article and then thought about places that I've consulted or worked at in the past is that people sometimes don't actually refer to the ethical code as much as they should, right? So they, 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 they looked at it, In graduate school, they took the class, they passed the exam, and then they're like, I know it. And then they never refer back to say like, oh, is what I'm doing ethical? I think so. But then they don't go check 
Go Wait. with your gut. That's what I say. No, yeah, I'm just kidding. Yeah, you do. You probably <laughs> no, say that. If you're a good person, well, it's, a it's probably <laughs> ethical, right? Isn't that and how so works? that, I mean, that concerned me too. Like I would, one of the things I do with my students is I challenge them to ask their clinic, their supervisors, when was the last time you opened up the ethics code? And the answers are so, I guess, not shocking because mm-hmm. I'm asking the question, but shocking in and of the same, mm-hmm. right? That they're not like, it's not like something that's well worn by their desk, right? That they're like looking at it and like referring to it. It's like, oh, probably before it actually was revised. It has been changed. Sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that- you know, it's interesting, but though it's not surprising. And actually, that's a really great question to ask of students. And I, I might have to adopt that. You can totally steal it. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's shocking. I also ask when we do EAB. When was the last time your supervisor opened up the experimental journal of experimental analysis of behavior? Yeah. The answer is I mean, to be never. honest, any journal might be yeah. a telling question. And, and I don't want to put the, you know, onus of fault on the practitioners for no. this, because I think that researchers and scientists can do a better job of getting this information to people in a consumable way. Because mm-hmm. sometimes even a simple question of how should I approach toileting right or least to most or most to least prompting is not an easy question and mm-hmm. then you end up 20 articles deep and you're like well it depends <laughs> right <laughs> which is why i would encourage folks to look at review papers you know doctoral yeah. students put a lot of work into those and they can really succinctly well relatively succinctly summarize a lot of what you might yeah. be trying to dig through on your own mm-hmm. um, you know review papers are worth their weight in gold and, you know, that's, that's an absolutely excellent suggestion because people have done the heavy work and, and I don't, I don't like to do reviews. I've, you know, I, every time I do one, I swear I'm never going to do one again. <laughs> two years by, and then someone talks me into another one and then I hate it again. But, you know, but when I think about ethics though, I think one of the ways the topic has historically been taught is, is one of fear and in punishment where it's yeah. like, this yeah. is this is correlated with bad things happening to you. And we don't teach students to recognize like, hey, like your everyday activities as behavior analysts falls under this, you know, just something as mundane and benign and, and you know, taking as taking data like that's a Tuesday for a behavior analyst. Right. And and so. I think, you know, that's one of the things that I try to try to, you know, instill in the students. I don't have any data to support that this is effective, but you know, I'm my hypothesis is by hopefully showing that it's, you know, this there's a lot of things here and it's complex and can apply in all these different ways and it embodies everything we do. And so we look at it that way and then hopefully it's, you know, much more like maybe all encompassing sort of understanding of it versus this is only a document I need to open up if something bad has happened. Mm -hmm. And that's just a no win situation for anybody. Mm. So Matt, when we get into, you know, we've got two articles to talk about. One I think is directly related to my problem. The other one I know you you mentioned when, when you, when you shared it with us, you said, don't get too... Don't get into some of the minutia of, of the of the study, but it is related to the idea of how do people make decisions. So why don't we start with that one? Because that one was pretty I think I got it. I think I got it. <laughs> but why don't we start with I was totally listening, but just in case <laughs> <laughs> I, I fully understand it. it but for the <laughs> listeners, maybe you should know. But decision making. You know, the articles on decision making and visual analysis, which I suppose people might say like, wait, 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 is this a visual analysis? This is a visual analysis podcast. And you guys do that already. I thought this was ethics, but you know, where did that article come from? And then I guess, you know, we can talk about how that relates to just the idea of humans making decisions. Right. So what is a decision-making study? Like what, what were you hoping in that study to kind of answer question wise? So it came from, so first like a series of master's student theses. So Kaylee Kip Miller, we published a study in Journal of Behavioral Education, and then another master's student, Darla Krill, and just want to give them both a shout out, you know, for, for their work on those, really sort of inspired this line, where I was talking with David Cox, you know, I, I've known David since like 2011, 2012, and he has this background in translational research and, and choice. And so we had this really this was just like a nerd session just gone out of control. We're like, what if we did this? And we had this, like, we created this 10 trial, like, you know, adjusting data path task. And we, and we put it in a choice context. Like, you know, 
what do you think we could get it. people to switch choices? I'm like, I don't know. That sounds cr- That sounds cool. Let's give it a shot. And, <laughs> and so it was, it was really like one of those things that we, it, it became a bit of a passion project. And, and then it was, and then we piloted it and we felt like we were really, we we're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that we actually got this to work. And then it, then it really sort of opened our eyes to, oh, wow, like there's a lot of things that we can study that are really relevant to, you know, things that happen in practice. I think, I think sometimes people might look yeah. at translational research or choice research and, and be like, you know, all the drug, the drug addiction stuff is really fine. The impulsivity stuff, it's great. But, you know, many practitioners, autism, developmental disabilities might have a hard time making that relation. And I don't, I don't blame them, but we want to talk about how delay or probability affects how we might look at a graph or how we might make a choice about a treatment decision. Like, you know, that is totally relevant. And so that, that's just been like, it hasn't been a mid career crisis. Cause I just don't think that I'm that old yet. <laughs> it, was, it, it has been transformative, I think, to how I've, you know, thought about the type of research that we want to do if hopefully that you know summarized that well mm-hmm. oh yeah so i mean some of the the, the background pieces for that i know you, you know the the goal was to sort of look at that indifference point or look at the idea of like probability discounting framework would you mind kind of describing like what the like what a probability discounting kind of framework is in in general yeah you know the basic notion here is that the value of a of a reward the perceived value of the reward decreases as the the probability of accessing it decreases. So, you know, with, with, with decrements in, in probability, so does the perceived value of that reward decrease. So given two outcomes, one choice being a 100% probability and the other choice being maybe a 50% probability and maybe the magnitude of the rewards being the same, I'd be, you know, would be selecting the outcome that is going to be more probable, more likely to be able to occur. And, you know, obviously behavior changes as those probabilities get manipulated and moved around. Mm -hmm. And it's just with that, you know, identifying these, these indifference points and putting it into, you know, the statistics and graphs. And, and I'm stealing this from David Cox, just to give full credit is, is that it provides us with really good shorthand information to describe general patterns of behavior. So, you know, still really appreciate the individual, you know, responding, you know, that, that we, you know, we've come to know and love as behavior analysts, but it allows us to, you know, make general inferences about patterns of behavior for groups of people, I think very nicely. And so at the end of the the study, you, you sort of did see some of those patterns related to the visual analysis, you know, the, the worse the uh, accuracy of the data being collected, the more likely the individual you know, participant would say, oh, this, this graphs, I, 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 this isn't doing what I want. I'm going to change treatment, right? It, it wasn't was it change treatment or keep, keep going the same way, or I'm going to change what's going on. And as the accuracy of the data improved, you notice that people would sort of wait longer to change treatment with that kind of the idea of, you know, will I change the treatment or keep the treatment being the decision point? You know, that's, that's the decision-making component. Were those results kind of the ones you expected? Yeah, when people think the the data is crummy, they probably are willing to act faster. And when they think the data is good, they're probably willing to ride it out a little more. Or, or was were there any kind of surprises there? Or was it just kind of a, a fun test? It, yeah, that was the that was the general you know hypothesis that we had going in. And so you know we were just hoping to be able to control things enough to be able to to, to demonstrate that. You know, in, in one of our pilot runs, we, you know, we had a little bit more variation in our data and we saw that that was, you know, affecting, it seemed to be affecting behavior mm. as well too. And and so that's something for, you know, later down the line, but we cleaned that up and made our graphs a lot more sort of trending upward in a consistent way to sort of wash that out. And so that was something that was unexpected there. But it was, you know, we had hope for those changes to be predicted by, you know, those decreases in, in data accuracy and stuff. And, um, of course, it's always nice when the hypothesis works out. Mm-hmm. But it, when it doesn't or when things go wrong, too, it, you know, I think that those are often the most, you know, enlightening findings because they, they lead you to, I think, research questions or, or ideas that you just hadn't envisioned otherwise, you know, mm-hmm. dropping everything and following, you know, what is useful or exciting. 
I was a participant in one of these kind of studies where they like gave you a whole bunch of graphs and you had to make decisions Same. about stressful. Right, exactly. You had oh to decide, God. like, are you gonna switch treatment? How confident do you feel? And I was sweating so much. Mm-hmm. I was like, they're gonna know. I don't <laughs> yes. know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's like a sting operation of like you're actually bad at your job. Right, right. You proved it experimentally. <laughs> Sorry. I think we were in the same study. I'm sure we were. <laughs> and I was Yeah, I actually had to go and change my shirt because I was so stressed. And when those come through, like the emails, and like, take this study on how good you are at your job. I'm like, no, I don't need to get fired. So just to say, we've decided away from future participation. (laughs) Don't email us. So Matt, when you and David were sort of talking about, let's look at the visual analysis piece. I mean, were you, were you maybe, maybe secretly, not secretly getting into like, what if we could use this framework to figure out every decision ever made, like, was it getting kind of that grandiose in the idea? (laughs) Or you're like, let's look at one thing on one thing only. And then we'll figure out, does that, does that pattern tell us anything about other more, possibly more complex decisions? Well, there, there's the emotional and and then there's the rational, right? And so (laughs) I, I think that we're both pretty strong believers in, you know, in this stuff. And I, and I think David's been the one who's really done a lot of educating, you know, to me about this and, and, you know, but does it just so well, you know, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really, really excited about this idea, but, you know, I think as a researcher, you have to be really methodical about it. And, you know, I'm, I'm less interested in visual analysis than, you know, the, the, the determinants of choice and and decision-making. And so, you know, visual analysis just happens to be, a really clean context that we can control and is, is, you know, close or to try to create a situation that's, you know, close enough ish as it can be, you know, for this translational study like this. And so, you know, that's one of the things that's always kind of, kind of tricky, you know, because there's been other studies we've done on visual analysis too. And it's, and it's difficult for me to try to communicate you know, this is less of a visual analysis study as is about decision making. Visual analysis just makes a really good context. But I love visual analysis too. <laughs> it's, all, it's all important. You know, when when we talk about translational research, I know it's it's not not my forte, Jackie. I'm probably one of the you ask your supervisor when they opened up uh, J Ab, and it's like, oh, like a year ago, it was like, a, you know, I know is, your answer. Is my response? Well, yeah, because you do the podcast <laughs> with me, so you know, the last time we had one on the show, <laughs> but I know. For me, when I see translational research, I I do always sort of want to make that jump of like, oh wait a minute, this answers everything. Now we know all the all the all the answers, you know. So when we're talking about decision making, that black and white thing, and that, yeah. that's me. <laughs> nope, that's it. We did it. <laughs> no, Matt did the article. He did talked about visual analysis. Now we know all the answers to ethics, right? That's how it works. But you know, even if it's just for fun, sort of extrapolate to that next point and in talking about decision making. I mean. Did you did you think of you know potentially a correlate to data accuracy in in the translational study to ethical decision making? I mean, I guess data accuracy could could be could be the value for your ethical decision making. But I would think it would be more things like you know risk of harm or honesty of reporting in in the situation that you have to decide about. I mean, was there like a direct correlate like that, or did you have one in mind? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. So actually, after this, like, we ended up running a study like that. And, and we're just, it's just been slow to write it up and, and hope to get it out the door soon where we had just ethical scenarios that were clear ethical violations, and we manipulated the report accuracy. So there's or probability yeah. that the report was accurate. And we saw, you know, again, the choices were They'll ask for more information or advise the person to report to the BACB. And 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 I know that there are multiple, those aren't the only two options, you know, for, for yeah. listeners. But you know, that is in, right or wrong. That's how right. ethics works, right? <laughs> but, but in the choice context, and when you're doing you know this pilot work, having just two choices is really something that just makes it clean. So that's you know, that's the, why we did that. And so, you know, a couple things there as 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 probability of statement accuracy decreased, you you saw more people switching to, oh, hey, you know, I'd like more information. I'd like more information, which which we had expected, you know, there too. But another thing that we didn't expect, though, it seems when, when I tell you this, you're going to go, yeah, of course, was that people seem to be more sensitive to different types of ethical violations where 
you know, even at 40% statement accuracy, Mm -hmm. some people were still, you know, noting, you know, this, I should advise the person to report this. But for others, you know, at 80% statement accuracy, they're like, you know, nah, you know, not not a big deal. And so, so that was interesting, though, Hmm. though, I mean, it totally makes sense. But that's one of those things we just didn't expect, but totally opens up a a whole other, you know, line of inquiry. Yeah, you, you mentioned it too, just even in the, in the visual analysis article, the idea that while there may be a way to sort of make grand statements about, you know, or the humans as a whole with some of these decision making, when it comes to the individual level, that prediction just might not be, you know, possible the way I think we, we would like, you know, those definitive like answers just due to so many factors. I mean, I, I would think the intensity or, or the you know, which codes were the, the bigger violations or perceived as, you know, less important violations would have a lot to do with the individual's history, whether, you know, oh, I got, I got in trouble for that code once or, oh, my supervisor said that code's outdated, right? I, I mean, is, would there be a value in looking at all those variables or, or do you think there might just be like, what are the big ones? And let's st- start there. No, no, I think absolutely. I think there'd be a lot of, a lot of value there. And, in, in, you know, what I would hope to do is, Gosh, you know, we did that study with maybe 20 or so people. Again, it was just, I wasn't sure if that was going to work. And it did. And we were like, wow. And and then COVID hit. And then that's the reason why, you know, I've had a hard time, you know, getting it out the door. But I think, you know, something like that distri- distributed at a larger level that, that captured the demographics of, you know, the respondents and, could allow us to run, you know, the correlational statistics that would be necessary to see, you know, how things correlated with, you know, maybe experience, you know, age, you know, I, you know, all sorts of things that I think are interesting and, you know, could, again, just help us better understand, you know, again, not to, you know, because the best prediction of anyone's, you know, future behavior is going to be their past behavior, but this allows us to just make general predictions or inferences, right, about how a group of people might behave under similar circumstances. Right, mm-hmm. and not for a punishing, like not for a punishing consequence potentially, but maybe for a, like a training, you could use it as a training opportunity, mm-hmm. right? Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, because you want teaching what to right. do instead of what yes. not to yeah. do. And I just, I like to, yeah, I always put that out there because when I, when we, like you said before, when we talk about ethics, people are like, but if I have to call the ethics hotline, then that means I've done something bad or I know someone who's done something bad. This is, this is what I right, hear. Right. Then you get a fun email back from John Bailey and say, oh my, I know John Bailey. I know him. He emailed me directly. But right. But I think you have done it a lot. Let's be honest. <laughs> but, <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. That's no, great. <laughs> no, but not, for, not because you're uh, engaging in eth- unethical behavior. Right. But the BACB has forced you to see a lot of ethical trainings, <laughs> haven't they? But, right? So, and I think I think it's better to be more proactive, right? And I think younger BCBAs may be more timid mm-hmm. to do that if they haven't had the proper training and support and oversight. I don't know this again. Like, we'd have to look at your correlations, right? To make that jump to be calling the hotline or hopefully they'll have a mentor that they can talk to. Mm -hmm. Right. But Mm -hmm. what we're seeing with the data is that many new BCBAs don't have that mentor Mm -hmm. or that supervision in place. I can't stress the importance enough of having somebody that you trust who is outside of your organization or place that you work to be able to call and get advice from. And, you know, when I, when my students friends, colleagues go into the workforce or get different jobs, it's, it's always just amazed me the things that come up. And it's just the nature of, of the work. And I, I suspect it's not different in, in other professions. There's just unique challenges that grad school cannot prepare you for. Mm-hmm. But I do not know, you know, I worry, like this keeps me up at night about like what my students would, would do if they weren't able to contact me or other people to be able to give them sound advice and the value in that. And I mean, I still, I've got people that I call when, when I have yeah. questions. And I think that, you know, I think the best, you know, behavior analysts or the type of leader that I aspire to be are looking to others for advice and continue to have their behavior shaped as well. And so there is the, there's incredible value to having people that you trust who can tell it to you straight and support right. you. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, so Matt, did some of that kind of that goal, you know, how can we teach ethical behavior rather than wait for someone to mess up and then sort of pillory them and be like, look, grad students, look at that person. They failed this code. Don't be like that person. I mean, was that sort of behind some of the work you've done in terms of looking at more systemic roles for people, you know, like the ethics coordinator role, for instance? I mean, I know that was an article we read and we talked about on a previous episode of the show where... You, you read it and you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Everything's very complicated. Wouldn't it be nice to just work in a place that just loved, you know, ethics so much <laughs> that they wanted to have someone whose job it was to help you with ethics? I mean, is that kind of where that came from or was that sort of a, a, a different process? Yeah, you, it, you know, it, it came out of this idea that I got kind of sick and tired of the, the, the ethics talks in the, you know, late 2000s, early 2010s, where it, it maybe even, I don't know, mid decade but it was just all like do these things or bad things happen to you mm-hmm. and i just felt like that is just not helpful and you know i talked about that like it, it's been a rather aversive topic you know for for some people and so you know my perspective has been we're behavior analysts let's act like behavior analysts and so if we want people to engage in you know behavior we need to arrange the environment so you know that behavior can happen we need to teach them how to engage in those responses and we you would never do like a just put a client or student into a classroom and just hope that they understand what it is that they need to do why would we you know ever do the same thing with our with our employees or you know supervisees and so it's it you know to me it's just been like well you know, let's just look at it from, you know, a systems perspective and think about what work do we need to do to, you know, make sure that people are supported, they understand what they need to do, the feedback systems are in place, and we can just foster all these things that need to happen because the consequences can be, you know, quite severe if, if mm. we don't. But the easy way is to, you know, the things that I'm talking about here take time, they take effort, and they don't in always or probably don't you know, result in, in activity that you can bill for. So you ha- it, it requires a certain level of commitment or acknowledgement that you're investing in consumer protection and you're investing in, you know, the well-being of your, your clients and students and, and the reputation of the field, really. Well, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll continue talking with Sir Dr. Matthew Broadhead about ethical decision making. We'll be right back. CBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. RegisCollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back talking with Dr. Matthew Broadhead all about ethical decision making. But before we get back into the conversation, I want to remind all of you listeners that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. By listening to the show, you're able to earn one ethics ce all you need to do is finish listening to the show then go to our website abainsidetrack.com slash get ceus that's g-e-t hyphen c-e-u-s and enter in some information including two secret code words and we're always fortunate we have a guest sometimes we get guest secret code words so i'll give you the first of those now it is banjo b-a-n J-O, banjo. Perhaps it's the musical instrument that Steve Martin plays or Kermit the Frog plays. Perhaps you're a big fan of the Nintendo 64 game Banjo-Kazooie. Huh? Maybe? Either way, it's it's banjo. All right, let's get back to our conversation. 
Now, have you seen more places or more organizations adopting ethics coordinators? I mean, I, I think I've I think I've even seen them in job descriptions. I mean, I don't know if everyone else is getting emails about like, hey, we're hiring BCPAs recently. But, you know, I do I do see that sometimes even mentioned in the hey, here's why you should work here kind of kind of blurb. I mean, it, that's just anecdotal. But I mean, have, have you seen a similar kind of growth and an acknowledgement of that being an important role? Yeah, I, I have. And it's been really great to see. And I know that there's been, you know, some large, you know, really visible organizations that have taken that. And, and I think some, you know, smaller, mid-sized ones, too. And so it's great to see that that acknowledgement. And I've also heard about, you know, organizations adopting like ethics committees. So places that people can go internally if they have questions and, you know, have their own sort of ethics hotline in-house. And I know that that's uh, something that's pretty common in business, you know, the business sector as well. And so it's, it's just, it's great to see people recognizing the importance of that. And again, leadership in those organizations investing the, you know, time and money into, you know, setting up those and hopefully continuing to support, right? Because it's one thing to put it there and to create the role and or create the committee, but then you have to continue to invest in the committee, the role and give it the resources it needs to actually do what it is that, you know, it's intended to. Can't just be for show. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> I can just only. put it on my, my desk, my desk sign. Ethical coordinator. Ethics what do you do here? Hey, right? Time for lunch, everybody. <laughs> Chipotle, anyone? Let's go. <laughs> By the way, I do not have a financial stake in Chipotle. I just want to make that clear. I have no conflicts of interest related to Chipotle. But I wish we all did. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, Chipotle, <laughs> if you're listening, please. We would like a financial interest. <laughs> I and stared longingly at three Chipotle burritos. Mm. I was like, "Oh, I should go there." But I can't. Well, not not so much the Chipotle stuff, but the the other stuff Matt was saying. Yes. I think mm-hmm. is a good segue into the other article, sort of looking into kind of the decision making that goes around choosing to work in a different organization. I mean, I, I think this is a good topic because one thing that I think you keep hearing, you know, in this these posts ending pandemic times would be people saying, I don't like the job I was at, I'm going to a new job. So perfect timing to be thinking about what are the questions to ask. And I'm guessing, Matt, after reading that article, just, hey, do you have an ethics coordinator? While probably a good question, it's not going to be the be all and and end all of decision making around whether you're working for an ethical company, right? Absolutely. I I think that really the ask or, or at least initially, you know, maybe an ask could be is, is to talk about the, the systems that are in place to teach and promote ethical behavior to the supervisory practices surrounding that. And this, this was great advice, you know, that was given to me, but to also to ask to see those documents or to see those materials. And, and I don't think that, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody was maybe surprised by that. But if asked the right way, you know, I think it's a fair ask. They probably would just be surprised that you're asking because no one's asked them that before. (laughs) But it's it's one thing to say that you have these things, but it's another thing to see it, see it in action. And then to maybe ask to talk with people who have experienced those within the organization so you can get the account there, too. I, I think that, you know especially for our first jobs, it's, we're, we're really attracted to, you know, all the things that come from not being a graduate student anymore. And there are, you know, graduate school is a wonderful place, you know, but it it doesn't pay very well as we all know. So, so, you know, we're, it's, it's hard sometimes to play the very deliberate game in terms of like really coming to understand, you know, what it is that you could potentially be signing up for. But I think we can become a little, you know, much more empowered by asking for something, receiving it, hopefully, you know, in a transparent manner. And then, okay, now I, I understand what it means to actually learn about an organization before I sign on to it. And One of the things we know about BCBAs is like, what, 50% of them or, or every year, you know, we, we almost, you know, double in size with their exponential growth. So you're always, always have new uh, grad students who are entering the workforce who maybe they're, they're younger, they're, they're a little more naive. Businesses that support behavior analysis, they want to be ethical all the time, right? There shouldn't be any reason they aren't always practicing ethics, right? 
Or are there reasons maybe your business might not follow ethics or maybe your, you know, our brand of ethics? Sure. I mean, I mean there's so many competing contingencies at play, right? And, and the BACB code only applies to people who have, you know, a, a credential that's, right, that's right. provided by the BACB and, you know, RBTs have one that's, you know, a little different. But, and so, you know, one thing to recognize there too, I think that people forget is that the organization isn't beholden to anything, you know, of course the law and, and anything that's, that's relevant there. But, you know, there are other people, there are accountants, there are, there are people with business backgrounds, you know, there are occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, and this is not to imply that any of those professions, you know, are, are better or worse or anything, but there's just a lot of really complex contingencies. And Mm so, you know, I think that that's one thing to be understood and, and just to be taken into account as one makes decisions and, you know, does an analysis of the environment and looks to just understand what it is that they're walking into, you know, so hopefully that answers, you know, that but I just, it's just, it's complex, right? I mean, that's, so it's a silly academic response or typical canned <laughs> academic answer, but I mean, it just really is. And, and there's contingencies that, that we just won't ever understand, you know, that are driving, especially if you're in one of these larger organizations that mm-hmm. unless you're at the top, there's just stuff that's just, you know, who knows, but that doesn't, that's not a justification to do things that are inappropriate. It's just, you know, helpful to kind of, you know, appreciate the complexities of, of, of the world. One sure. of, one of, I think one of a, a, a clear example of this is in the previous code when they were talking about testimonials yep. and how behavior analysts cannot provide testimonials and we can't provide like clients on websites, even if parents permission, like they had permission, right? If they were a current client. And so a lot of smaller ABA companies in, in our region uh, weren't using testimonials because they are the BCBA, right? So they have to uphold the ethical code. And then, but larger organizations that had, say, a marketing team or had, you know, other people that were outside the realm of behavior analysts were using all these testimonials, right? They're like, this they is the, the best. Posting them. They yeah. were posting it. But then when you brought it up to the organization being like, well, as behavior analysts, we can't use testimonials. They'd say, well, our marketing team is not a behavior. They're not behavior analysts. They don't have to go apply by these same rules. So I think that's a that's a really concrete example of how it kind of was put into action, right? Where they're like, but I can do it because, mm-hmm. cause I'm not a behavior analyst. So. Yeah. I, I thought that, I thought that that was fascinating. And, and there were, there were a series of papers that went back and forth in behavior analysis, research and practice on this. If, if anyone's some mm-hmm. who and burn. And I think that Ben Witts and Shelt drop, I'm trying to remember the other's name. Sorry. It's just really interesting stuff because, you know, I think an argument could be made and I'm not saying that testimonials are good. They should be used, but you know, you're an organization and you're trying to grow, you're trying to expand services. You're basically out, you know, against your competition, right? You like, mm-hmm. if you've got a big box company that's able to use this marketing tool, but you've been, your hands are tied on, on your ability to be able to do that. I mean, I just think that that creates an interesting challenge for the business owner. And I'm not saying that it's, you know, right or wrong in any way. I, I just think it's like the whole situation is just really complex. And so, you know, I've, I've, I've been pretty, I don't know, just like ambivalent about my perspective on, on testimonials, but also like understanding that like context, right, is so important to sort of, yeah. you know, determine when it could or could not be appropriate and, and you know how it's solicited or if it isn't solicited and right. the status of the client or their former current or you know what I mean and so it's just obviously a lot more complex than right. sorry I can't do a yes or right. no like decision making algorithm <laughs> no. I, I, think it's, I think it's much helpful uh, I think the new ethics code really is a is a it's it's not a yes or no right so it's right. more like yeah look at whether it's appropriate and if you feel based on your decision that it's appropriate make sure you state exactly who they are and that they got photo release and that all of this and then you're okay but make sure that you can defend your actions right so i i think that the the new the newer code when it talks about testimonials and and the website and you know like i think they it it does a, a much better job giving everyone access to things and making sure that all everyone is you know thinking about it just saying like no you can't do it no right Right. Mm-hmm. Right. 
under no circumstances. Because then, right, like, when I'm teaching the class in the old ethics code, we're, like, looking at websites, and then all my students are writing on all the websites that have testimonials and then sending them to the BACB. Oh, gosh. Right? Because then they're just so black and white. And I'm like, well, that legal's not really going to want How that. How do they have time to make an ethical <laughs> violate? The last time I had to do it, it took me like a full day between the state <laughs> licensure board and the, oh, man, it took forever. It was, yeah, so it's 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 not as <laughs> easy. You really get your students hyped up about ethics, though. I do. They are that they'll spend excited a weekend just, about ethics. Wow. Matt, I make little ethics handbooks, which I still have to do. I got to get on that. I love COVID those. Kind of those are good. I make, I, I, I like that. I borrow that. I did mm-hmm. yeah, I like the little books. I print them out. I print the ethics code out in like little pocket size and put them front to back and laminate them and put a little ring on them so that they can fit in your back pocket. So at any point, if I see any of my students or alumni, I ask, where's your ethics handbook? <laughs> So that then, and most of them actually have it on their selves, <laughs> right? In their bag or in their purse. One one, and I went to a restaurant, one had it in her purse. She's like, look, and it was well worn. And I was very happy, Aww. even if it was just because it was in her purse for two years, but still. And then ironically, she dined and dashed too. So <laughs> yeah. I don't care about that. That's not going work. You can do whatever you want in your personal life as long as it's, I don't have to know about it. <laughs> I love it. I think I think it's great. And then I'm also going to say, I used to work in in the rare book room at at Western Michigan University Library. We did book repair and would like make books for fun. And so I've got like <laughs> like this weird like niche interest in like what you were just talking about there. I'm like, I want to like find like a really <laughs> like fancy like BACB right. code. That sounds like way cool. Ooh. Yeah, you guys should make an illustrated text. Oh, we can yeah, like a graphic, text. like <laughs> yeah, ethics code. The graphic ethics code. I want like medieval style illumination at each one. the start oh, of each section. Text, yeah. Code one, woo! <laughs> yeah. Monks spent a hundred years making this from the Vikings. Yeah, it'll it'll be changed by the time it's done. So don't don't <laughs> get too fancy. My guilt in code. Twenty twenty six. Just kidding. Just kidding. The BACB everyone's saying I'm not uh. saying anything bad about it. So we're, we're your your, protect, your prospective employer, right? We talked about some some positives. You know, do they have an ethics coordinator? Do they have documentation that you've asked to see? Maybe they say we give all of our employees these fancy illuminated ethics books they can keep with them at all times. <laughs> these are all probably positive things. What are the other kind of you know? I think I put in the notes red flags, but I would say probably green flags yeah. that you'd want to mm-hmm. look yeah. for when you're sort of thinking about what is important in this organization that will promote my ethical professional development, the ethical practice. I don't think I'm going to be put in too many terrible situations. So they're kind of like some, some other big kind of green flags that, that you, you can think of. You know, I think about, you know, maybe how long people have been working at the organization. So you think about retention and I think it's going to be, you know, a really big one that, that is certainly important. The money that they may give to you in terms of your own professional development and, the resources that you know they write into your contract that you will get every year for being you know for doing your job and and hopefully you know making your your skills knowledge abilities you know better and more improved over time the the commitment to maybe hiring an outside help or support in the event that there is ever an issue or problem, like the, the training materials that are available, the, the the quality of the training materials, how often the training materials are revised. I mean, these are you know, you, you could go on and on about this kind of stuff, but I, but I think that you know, also too, when we're asking these questions and hopefully doing so, you know, I always advise people to have these you know conversations in person maybe over the phone, definitely not through email because it's really difficult to be able to judge, you know, the tone or, or, or get a read on somebody, but, but hopefully they're being transparent and open and in, in willing to share these things. I, you know, I recognize there's some stuff that might be proprietary mm-hmm. and, you know, I business has every right to be able to protect that. And so you might acknowledge that, but you know, I don't know, like for everything else, like just open it up and let's take a look under the hood and see. And, You know, I think transparency, you know, and willingness to be open and show and share and let you observe and talking with people who have been there before or still, I think is really going to go a long way. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the flip side, if I'm going down my decision tree, do you have any fun, like 
Eh, red flag. No, you probably want to run screaming from the interview if you're interested in, in not having ethical violations. You know, one of the things that this is a roundabout way to the question. If I don't fully answer it, let me know. But I and then I'll then I'll come back and, and give it a better shot. But I, I think one of the major red flags that creates issues for people repeatedly is the organization's use of of non-compete clauses. And I know I talk about that in in the article. Mm-hmm. But like they are really problematic, you know, by, you know, so for listeners unaware, it's a clause that will stipulate the geographical region and length of time in which you will not engage in behavior analytic activity or, you know, related work after leaving the organization. So what that basically let's say, okay, Matt can't work within 50 mile radius of the Lansing area for two years. And so what that does then is that if you are working for that organization and, and something you know sticky is happening, you can't get yourself out of it, that if you want to change jobs, you need to move out of the area or you're looking at a really long commute. Mm-hmm. Now, they're really bad for the economy. They're bad for em- employee growth. They're bad for morale. And there's actually a recent executive order that President Biden had signed that, you know, was working against, you know, the use of implementation or use or implementation of non-compete clauses. Organizations often, you know, will say, well, we need to protect our business interests. We need to protect our clients. You know, we can't have people poaching our clients. You know, my argument there is, okay, well, a non-solicitation clause seems certainly fine. You know, Mm -hmm. ask me not to solicit your clients. That certainly sounds fine you know, ask me not to take your proprietary information. Like That is certainly mm-hmm. fine. But also remember with clients, in, I mean, this is my perspective that people have a right to be able to choose their own, you know, healthcare provider. So right. if I leave and a client willingly wants to follow me and I don't solicit them, then, you know, obviously that, that then too becomes an interesting issue or question. But so I think all of those things are fair though, right? Thou shall not poach clients. Thou shall not walk off with all the training materials. But, but to, to force somebody to sign a document that prevent, prohibits them from working or making a living within an area. And we're talking sometimes they say like the entire state. Yeah. Or sometimes it's like within 10 miles of everywhere we provide services in this organization. Is, in, is in every home and <laughs> yeah. every you know, city. Right. And so I just don't want people to fall into that. And and I will say this, that for every time that we've had students encounter a non-compete clause and we've asked for it to be removed, we've gotten it out. Mm -hmm. And so don't ever, for anyone's listening, let somebody say that that can't happen. Everything in the contract is negotiable and get a lawyer if you're confused about anything because it will be worth the money spent because You'd rather pay a couple hundred bucks then than thousands later if the issue gets litigated. Mm -hmm. So lawyer up. It's not a bad idea if you ever have any legal questions with that. So I hope, I don't know. That was like my, that was a bit of a rant maybe (laughs) instead of an answer to a question, (laughs) but like that, that maybe that's just been something that's really been bothering me. I mean, since we wrote this paper, but also, you know, recently I've been working out a project where we have some data that, that shows that non-competes are pretty pervasive and they're being used in ways that are really unacceptable. And it just, it it prevents people from working. It prevents growth and it harms access to high quality care. And so it's the consumers of behavior analysis that are, that are being harmed by these really selfish, and I'm going to say it really selfish business Mm -hmm. decisions. Mm. And I'm going to drop the mic. (laughs) (laughs) that was good advice i think there's a lot of really good questions that are offered in this article for folks to ask and i like that it's all like succinctly summarized here in one place you're so good at that by the way Mm. in all your articles that you ever wrote you're like very succinct matt (laughs) Thank you, because I like to talk and I don't wear a watch. And, <laughs> but but I you know I credit I credit my advisor Tom Higby to that because you know Tom was always like you got to make it practical mm-hmm. you know got to give things that people can use you know it's like these takeaway tables or these takeaway figures mm-hmm. and I try and you know, emulate that, you know, carry that forward in, in the research or in, in teaching or presentations too. And you know, I I think about what would I want 
you know, if, if, if I was reading this article and, you know, all of the papers, all of the ethics papers that I've written are born from personal experience mm-hmm. or things that we've encountered where we've been like, well, shoot, what do we do? Well, there's nothing there. I, I can't imagine we're the only ones. So let's let's write this up because I'm sure other people could, could benefit from that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Matt, kind of speaking to the, the practicality of an article like this, you have just a very informative, like you said, just a big table. Like here are some great questions to ask. I know you certainly recommend that prospective employees not just take your table of questions and sort of just like run down the list of the questions as that will probably make you seem unhirable. I mean, I, you know, even if it's an ethical organization that probably come off as a little weird, but do you have some like favorites that you think capture so much of what someone who's new to the new to the field might want to ask just to get as much information as possible in as brief a time as possible? You know, I guess at this moment, if I were to only get one crack at it, you know, I would maybe the question describe the systems that are in place to help employees engage in ethical behavior and avoid yeah. unethical behavior. And and hopefully that would that would lead into, you know, other things there as well. Especially if they had an answer. Right. If they didn't have an answer, if, if the person yeah. was like, well, no one's what? ever asked us that before. Let's huh? see. Right. If mm-hmm. they say, let's see, probably should get out. Or, or at least you know what you're getting into. Right, you know? that's true. <laughs> <laughs> at yeah. the very least, right? Let, let's just, okay, could be could be a train wreck, but like right. I know what I'm signing up for. Right. Could be it could be great. Could be a you know, behind the door it's a thousand bucks, or it could be a goat. You, you never know. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I would love a goat. But there's so Why? many small startup businesses out there that people may never have thought about this question sure. before, mm-hmm. right? Which is also a, a good point to bring up is be careful who you're starting to work for. Mm-hmm. And if you're if you're the person starting out on your own business, give yourself some time before you hang out your shingle so you know what you're doing. Shingles. I liked the question to piggyback off of that, which was how, what are the systems you have in place for mentoring and supervising new mm-hmm. BCBAs? Mm-hmm. And that's one that I encourage my students to ask as well, because... There's a very big variety <laughs> of the types of you know quality mentorship and supervision that you're going to get as a new BCBA, and just you know passing the test and getting those letters doesn't tell you everything you need to know, as we talked about earlier. And without having solid mentorship and someone that you can go to with the questions you're inevitably going to have, then you could find yourself in some murky ethical territory as well as over your head clinically. Right. Mm-hmm. Too. So I think that's a super important question to ask. Yeah. Did y'all have favorites? I, I like that one. Too. I like both of those questions. I think, yeah, you know, like you said, Diana, one of the challenges I think when you're being, you know, newly hired and it's maybe your first job out of graduate school, is the excitement of someday I'm going to know so much more and I'm going to be so good at this job. And I think anyone who's been in the field for a long time will know one of the scariest moments is when you realize, uh oh. I'm the person oh, no. with the most knowledge. <laughs> I have to answer all the questions. I'm in charge. <laughs> How did that happen? So, you know, you got to be careful what you wish for there. And as long as you can be in an organization where there's at least one person who is like, I've been studying ethics for a long time, or I've read all of the ethics articles. Okay, good. That's, that's, that's a good sign. It doesn't have to be at your organization either. No, or that you still have access that to, you yes. No, or have, you know, found along the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My favorite, my favorite are the bottom two. How does the organization collaborate with other providers to create a continuum of care? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the times I find when I'm working with students right now that there isn't a continuum of care, Mm -hmm. right? It's really like, we don't talk to speech or OT because we don't do speech or OT. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't need to talk to speech about this one problem, even though it's a very clearly primarily Mm speech-related problem. Mm -hmm. So I like that one. And then how you evaluate cultural responsiveness. Mm -hmm and how they accommodate cultural backgrounds of the clients. I'm super glad to see that included Mm -hmm. here. Even in 2018. Woo! Ahead of the the curve. curve. You guys haven't been married for nine years for no reason. (laughs) We've been married for 200 podcast episodes, Jackie. (laughs) At least. I've been married to you for 200 episodes. We've also been married for 200 (laughs) podcast episodes. (laughs) Woo! All right. But then my additional point related to this was I love how you folks noted in here, 
not just don't ask all these questions in a row, but be careful in the way that you're asking yeah. the questions too, right? Yeah. So it's awesome if you're a, you know out there job searching and have this type of background and preparation so that you can you know, suss out what's going to be a good company to work for, but just going in and firing off all of those questions could be really off-putting. So you, you gave some nice um, it, examples of how you might kind of slowly broach yeah. some of the tougher questions in here too, which was really useful. You mm-hmm. might be perceived as sassy. Yeah. <laughs> sassy frassy. If you just add like... And later on, if you need to rock the boat, that's good, but maybe not in the initial interview. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, you think about interviewing as a, you know, it's a discriminated operant, right? Or good interviewing. And, mm-hmm. and it's something that needs to be practiced, taught, maintained. And so it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to, to practice that before you go out or, or to recognize that it might take a couple times to, to really hone it in. And I think about myself, I'm not planning on leaving MSU. I just want to be clear here. But I mean, we're hiring at Regis, Matt. If you want, if you want to move to the to Northeast. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, like I could, I could be cold and, and wet. That sounds good, it's like the Midwest. But it's like you know, I I would need to brush up on my interviewing skills if I had to go back on the market. And oh, yeah. you know, it's just one of those things. Just to just to be to be honest, like it's just out of practice, and so. You know, there's no harm in that, but you know, it doesn't it doesn't hurt to be prepared for that. And actually, I have I have a friend who won't be named, but they just go on interviews every you know year or so, and just to keep the skills up <laughs> to find that's the right smart. job. And I've always just thought like that's yeah, they're like you know I'm, I'm considering it. It's not like I'm stringing them along, but I I, I want to keep the tools sharp. Okay. I get it. Well, so. they know what's out there, right? Yeah. That's, I like that, that. That's right. I like that. I'm not going to do that, though. I would. If you ever found out, Diana would literally <laughs> murder me in my sleep. <laughs> She'd cut my heart out. I think this would never. This, I'm like Max Jones. Yeah. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's like a min-maxing to how you're going to do your job interview because you want to get you know, the questions that are going to give you the most information about the ethical systems that will promote your own ethical behavior within the organization. But at the same time, that's all you ask about. And you forget to ask how much do you pay or what are my benefits? Right. You also might find yourself in the ethical conundrum of like, Ooh, I really got to break this contract and dump all my clients because right. I'm only getting paid like, you know, eight fifty an hour. I kind of need to pay back my student loans. Uh, so, you know, th- th- there's a lot you have to get in there uh, yeah. in that great two way street of uh, applying for a job. No, you, you have to really ride it out. I think that, you know, organizations are really eager to hire. They have mm-hmm. been and, the, and they mm-hmm. are, you know, really now. And so, you, you know, the offers come in so fast and the ink is just so soaking wet on the contract and you, and they've got these deadlines on them mm-hmm. and, you know, signed by the state, but that deadline is negotiable. You know, you can go back in there and look around some more and you can keep on finding information until you have all of the information you need to make an informed decision. So it's like we feel like we have all these pressures, but you're in the position, you have the offer, you're in the position with some leverage now. They want you and they're not they didn't go through all this work just to, you know, see you go, at least not without, you know, effort. All right. Well, I think it's about time to move into our last section, the dissemination station on the show. And like I said at the that beginning, train. <laughs> this this might be my last dissemination station because I, I've got this great offer from this from this job. So Matt, can we? <laughs> why don't we go through? I've got you here. You know, you're here on the show. You've been so Hi. gracious with your time. Let's go through kind of an ethical decision tree about this new job. Okay, is that okay? Will you help me out with this? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to try. If if I get it wrong, it was Sir Matthew Broadhead. Yeah. Okay, okay, that other, that other guy. That's fair. All right, You're so twins. so so we'll we'll do this. I'll, I'll I'll tell you something about the organization, and you tell me yes or no. Should I should I kind of keep going? All right, they're going to pay me. They're going to pay me five hundred thousand dollars a year. They're really like breaking the bank for me. Oh, is this is this like like accounting inflation too? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, of course, yes. Okay. Full, full medical, full dental, you know, the, the, the whole shebang. Good. Yeah. No, I'm all for like, you know, accessible healthcare and access to, you know, those sort of you know, preventative healthcare services. So 
Absolutely. Booyah. Okay. So keep it. Okay. Good. This is going great so far. Okay. I might be asked to do things as a BCBA that usually SLPs and OTs do, right? So like not necessarily my level of competence, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm pretty smart. I think I can figure it out, right? They, they said that's fine. Everyone there does it. Right. Well, well, if it falls within the scope of practice and you in you, it's within your scope of competence, then, then you know, it might, might be all right under the right circumstances. But I would I would wonder, given this case, and I might have some questions um, okay. that you might at least want to follow up on. Is that is that a nuance on there or do you just want me to give you a straight up no? <laughs> no, you can, yeah. do, you can do nuance. I really want that $500,000 a year, Matt. So I'll, <laughs> right. I'll accept the nuance. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and there's some kickback to me too, right? If we get all the way to the, you signing mm-hmm. the contract, right? So I I have a financial stake in this too. <laughs> That's exactly. Yeah, you're gonna be my consultant for the <laughs> for the hiring. I'm like a headhunter, right? <laughs> They don't have an ethical coordinator. They don't follow the BACB code of ethics. They said that, you know, if I want to, that's fine. But I have to make sure I understand that the company comes first. All right. So I, I can't be bringing them any ethical problems. What do you think? Hard no. That's yeah, where I'm, I, I'm not paying you, Jackie. I'm paying. <laughs> I'm paying. <laughs> I'd be like, you know, like Mr. Burns and the Simpsons, but yeah. like Smithers released the hounds. Like, <laughs> that might be, you know, a time to just bounce. Yeah. It's a oh, deal breaker. All right. All right. I guess, guess I'm stuck doing this podcast or maybe another 200 episodes or so. All right. By the way, I knew that reference. So I feel so great. That's nice. <laughs> I never get any. It only references. took 200 episodes for you to get a reference. <laughs> yes. Yay! <laughs> I am waiting. Woo. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate it, Matt. It's probably for my best interest as an ethical, you know, behavior analyst to not work at a company that is going to, you know, not allow me to practice what I what I know. So thank you so much. But I also can't pay you now because they know, have food I truck Wednesdays though. Does that change it. They do have food truck Wednesdays. Yes. Oh no. <laughs> Yes. I'm in. <laughs> nope. yeah, my job be- did food truck Wednesdays one time. Did what? They? Yeah, my job did food truck Wednesdays one time when nobody was on campus. And so it was just like me and like three other people at food truck Wednesdays. Ouch. <laughs> that was awesome. You made like 25 tacos? Yep. Nice. Yeah. I kept going back. I'm like, oh, don't mind if I do. <laughs> <laughs> I had a job All once right. where they faxed us over a thing. It was when I was working in retail and they said, if you can sell this many, I think it was like Nintendo 64s, you know, you we're going to pay for store. lunch. And it was a freaking blizzard. So nobody came in the store that day. We still almost made it. We almost made our goal. You bought them all yourself. No. Yeah, right. I was not a minimum wage in Massachusetts at the time. You've heard it so many times. <laughs> You've all got golden eye going on like 10 yeah, different right. TVs. <laughs> but, like, that sounds like a dream come true. You know, like, you know, it, it was good at the time, but when, you know, the parking lot is just covered in snow, it's sort of frustrating to, you, you don't have the foot traffic you were expecting on, you know, Friday night when everyone's <laughs> stuck at <funny>. home. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry, I derailed us. Yeah. All right. Well, Matt, I appreciate your help with my, with my job in, in terms of kind of next steps for ethical decision-making research, or I, I know you have a study that'll, that'll hopefully be coming out in the near future, kind of looking a little bit more at those decision trees. I mean, do you have any other kind of ideas or, or branches of that research that you're you, that's per- percolating right now or in process? Yeah, you know, with, with regard to decision making, one of my doc students, Allison White, and I are looking at, you know, delays to treatment outcomes and how that affects decision making. So we're really looking forward, you know, we've got one paper under review right now and, and you know, hopefully further studies in the, in the future. But with, with ethics in particular, we've got a second edition of our Practical Ethics for Effective Treatment of ASD book coming out soon. We're hopefully going to be, by the end of the year, publishing an edited volume with Norris Syed, Sean Quigley, and David Cox as editors on research ethics and behavior analysis. And then nice. David and I are also doing a special issue on ethics and behavior analysis and data in oh. behavior analysis and practice. And so papers are due to that. September 1st, 2022. So if anyone listens to this before that deadline and has an idea for a paper, I suggest you check out the behavior analysis and practice website for the call or email me or David. And I'm at mtb at msu.edu. Happy to chat about that. But there's always things in the works and and ideas. And, you know, you know, the problem, there's never enough time in the day to get it done, (laughs) which is a good thing. So I just I look forward to sharing and and getting to, to, you know, hopefully provide helpful stuff that makes everybody's lives a little easier and, and learning from everyone in the process. 
And Matt, That's that cool. email address would be good too. If I get that second edition, if I just want to email you, get the secret yes or no answer <laughs> to all of the ethical scenarios like that, that'll yeah. work. Yeah. You know, if, again, if you're comfortable and, and I will, I will ride this joke out. So I guarantee <laughs> it that this will happen. Send me your mailing address and then I will send you a redacted <laughs> version of the second edition oh in a oh, phys- physical form. It's just like, I, and I just got to share this story too. Like uh, right before COVID hit, I was talking with Jason Vladesco at, at, at a conference out, out in Nebraska. And I was like, Jason, I'm going to send you a Christmas card. I just met him. I'm like, I'm going to send you a Christmas card. He's like, yeah, whatever. He gave me his address. And like, you know, nine months later, you know, there <laughs> came in and he emailed me. He's like, I can't believe you actually did it. <laughs> I, I will wait as long as I need to, to make this joke happen. So when that book comes out, I will do it and you will get it. And I hope. Hey, I look forward to, you know, hearing about it on the pod that I got. <laughs> All so right. You're that's, welcome. You will hear about it. That's a guarantee. I do I do For love my, myself, you know, special signed copies of books, especially if the, all the content's been redacted, exactly. so I can read it very quickly. <laughs> it just smells like a Sharpie. <laughs> right? <laughs> Once again, we want to say a big, big thank you to Dr. Matthew Broadhead for coming on the show and talking to us all about ethical decision making. We've been huge fans of his work for a long time. We featured a lot of his articles on the show, so it was a real treat, especially as we're round to the bend on episode 200 to actually have Matt here on the show talking about some of his papers. And as he mentioned, I would give a plug and say to purchase his Practical Ethics for Effective Treatment of Autism Spectrum Disorders edition. However, as he said at the show, a second edition will be coming out soon. So you probably want to wait until that second edition comes out. But if it's anything like the first edition, it is a very in-depth look at the complexities of ethical decision making in a way that, while frustrating to me, who likes to see the world in black and white, even I appreciate. And again, that's by Matthew, Matt, David Cox, and Sean Quigley. But new edition will be coming out soon. Perhaps we'll even get my my special redacted edition (laughs) coming my way later. We want to make sure to also thank all of you for listening to our show. We've been doing this show for over six years now, and it is still amazing when people shoot us an email, visit the website, download the show, leave us feedback anywhere. So thank you very, very much for that. If you're new to the show, well, and you'd like to join some of uh, some of those listeners, you can certainly subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. You can leave us reviews there. We really appreciate those. You can also go to our website and leave comments. That's abainsidetrack.com. That's all also where you'll find links to all of our previous episodes, links to purchase CEs, and to read the articles that we discuss on each episode of the show. And if you say, man, I want even more ABA Inside Track content, well, you can certainly find us on all the socials as ABA Inside Track, or go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where for just $5 a month, you can get early access to all of our episodes, as well as access to some bonus features like voting on, say, our book club picks or a quarterly episode that is only live for patrons on the show, where you can also earn discounts at the CE store as well as some free CEs. And if you want even more of some of that you know, special premium action, you can subscribe at the $10 level to get immediate access to all of our two plus hour long book club episodes. At the time of this recording, uh, we'll probably be getting out our vote for our next book club, but we just recently released the Look Me in the Eye book club, uh, where we discussed the memoir by John Elder Robeson about growing up in the 60s and 70s as an adult who's undiagnosed with autism and his experiences and what that means to us as practitioners in terms of understanding or better understanding the individual and their life experience. Again, those are worth two CEs and no extra charge if you're a patron. So please check them out. In addition to that book club, you'll also get access to our future book clubs, as well as all of the previous book clubs we've done. We've talked about meaningful differences, the other end of the leash, you know, nice eclectic bunch of books for behavior analysts to enjoy reading and enjoy hearing a discussion of it. Again, that's patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. And if you just want to shoot us in a, a little email, feel free to do so anytime at ABA Inside Track at gmail.com. And of course, you probably all want to know what the second secret code word is so you can earn that ethics CE. So again, it's our special guest code word, and it is two words to celebrate our 200th episode, I think. Downhill skiing. D-O-W-N-H-I-L-L is the downhill, and then skiing, S-K-I-I-N-G. Downhill skiing, much like that classic Disney short where Goofy learns to ski and you get that great yodeling sound. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? 
downhill skiing. You can put a space or no space. It's okay. We'll, we'll know what you mean. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't once again thank our guest, Sir Dr. Matthew Broadhead, if I didn't thank my fabulous co-host, Jackie and Diana, and if I didn't thank some of the people who make this podcast much easier to produce and create than when we first started. So big thanks to Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, Kyle Sturry for writing our interstitial music, and of course, Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for all of the great editing work he's done, which honestly, without, I, without which I don't know if I could have made it to 200 episodes when I was doing it all by myself. Uh, it was certainly harder to listen to those at the time. So thank you, Dan. All right, we'll be back next week with yet another in the span of ABA Inside Track episodes. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye.